Contraindications. What time is it? Oh, great. Uh, it's pr 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 pretty basic. Um, I wish I could show you, but it doesn't appear on the screen. Um, a great chart. Um, this isn't actually contraindications. This is um, uh, drugs to not mix together. Um, very important. It's by tripsit.me. You won't be able to see it on here, uh, but uh, you can't even read it there. But you know, I highly recommend. It's a very interesting. Share it with your friends. Tripsit.me. It goes through most of the common recreational drugs, which you can't see. The red means very, very dangerous to mix. The green means not dangerous to mix. Um, what to know about MDMA? Uh, it's not good to mix MDMA with any other monoamine stimulant or kind of drug like cocaine, meth, the bath salts, etc. Your people have done it. You're generally upping your risk of hyperthermia by doing that, because remember that's related to blood pressure and heart rate and things like that. Uh, most of the classical hallucinogens, there's no danger, no greater danger in mixing them with MDMA. Um, LSD, mushrooms. Um, medications that affect blood pressure, uh, Monoamine oxidase inhibitors, very, very dangerous. Everyone really knows that, though. Most people, I don't think they prescribe them, MAO inhibitors, very much. But that's a certain recipe for death, because that will prevent the breakdown of monoamines uh, in your brain when you're on them. But you'll get a lot of warnings if you're taking one of those. One of the myths is that it's dangerous to take MDMA while you're on an SSRI. I would say the only reason that might be true is because um, you won't feel much if you take MDMA while you're on an SSRI. And then that might lead you to start taking more. But uh, SSRIs like Prozac, Zoloft, they block the same molecule, the reuptake transporter for serotonin that MDMA works on. And they have a higher affinity for that transporter. So they, you, that will actually prevent the effects of uh, MDMA. If you don't want your teenager to take MDMA, uh, put them on Prozac. They won't be able to feel the MDMA. Wait, no, no, I'm just kidding. That could have more negative effects than, um, than them taking MDMA occasionally. Um, yeah, heart conditions. Um, one interesting thing is that uh, MDMA is processed through the CYP2D6 liver enzyme. And there's a certain percentage of the population that are called slow metabolizers. They have less of this enzyme. And, and those people will feel a heightened effect from the same dose of MDMA and may have a slightly greater risk of hyperthermia um, than people who are normal metabolizers. Um, when in doubt, you know, all, if you're a new user, if your friend is a new user, give them half a pill. Give them you know, 70 milligrams. 70 milligrams still works. It actually, in the therapeutic studies, had, have, has a greater therapeutic outcome than the 125 milligram dose. Uh, but if somebody has, for whatever reason, whether it's a liver enzyme or uh, hypersensitivity to norepinephrine or malignant hyperthermia uh, or perhaps uh, people who have survivors of meningitis or become heat sensitive, you know, they'll know. I said before it's like usually new users that are dying. I think that if uh, someone takes NDMA and they have this hyperthermia react, they don't use it again very much. You know, they, they know. I think there are a lot of people out there who have taken it once, had this negative hyperthermia reaction, survived it, but then they know and now they're scared and they don't take it. So there's this self-selection, you know, people who have a negative reaction, some they just generally won't use it again, you know. So um, you know, you, and you'll know even on a 70 milligram dose whether that's the case. So, you know, keep that in mind. People are, sen people are sensitive. Oh, look, I didn't know what that up there. Uh, but whatever, I'll keep that up there. 
I don't think we have time to go through the pharmacology slideshow, but uh, there's really interest. Who's, who's been to it, by the way? I'm just curious. It's the most viewed page on the Dance Safe site. My, and this is your brain on ecstasy, uh, really. I'll just show it to you. Um, yeah, so it takes you through what happens in your brain. You know, everybody here probably understands a, a neuron. And, and um, oh, this is interesting. Like, most people think of brain cells, and they think uh, that they're these little things, a little one here, a little one there, a little one here, right? And, but, but, and that might be the case with uh, many, but it's not with your serotonin brain cells. All your serotonin brain cells, the cell bodies are in the raphine nuclei, in the brain stem. The dendrites point down into your spinal column. And the axons, which store the serotonin, they innervate the entire brain. Like if you stretched one out on a table, it would be a foot long with Christmas tree branches uh, innervating every part of the brain. Serotonin is considered by uh, neuroscientists to be a globalizing neurotransmitter. It modulates sleep, appetite, uh, sexual arousal, et cetera. Um, and a lot of different functions. Um, and so when you think about it, you take the MDMA and it's, it's releasing serotonin in you, you know, your entire brain. The, all of your brain's axons are now releasing uh, their serotonin. How it does that, that's a rat brain, stain serotonin axons, um, getting closer up to where the axon meets the dendrite and there's that gap in there they call the synapse. It's a little closer view. Um, I drew these back in uh, 1998 myself using Photoshop. <laughs> uh, they need to be, oh, here's an actual axon and you can see more um, axons too that aren't stained, kind of sort of invisible there. And here we get to, you know, and a lot, lot, a lot of scientists will draw the serotonin reuptake transporters as revolving doors, like those yellow H's. And then normally the, your brain, your serotonin is released through these vesicles, those purple things are probably not really purple, but, uh, and then the, they get taken back up for storage through the reuptake transporters. And then these are like receptors on the dendrite that receives the neurotransmitters and sends an electrical signal down uh, its axon to you know, either release or to not release its own neurotransmitter, depending on whether it's an excitatory or an inhibitory neurotransmitter. What they say about MDMA that makes it so useful in psychotherapy and that produces the compelling effect that uh, makes people want to use it recreationally is that Serotonin in the, right, in the brain areas is either excitatory or inhibitory in all the right places. So it makes you alert, but it doesn't make you all speed it out. It relaxes you at the same time. It reduces the fear response in the, amyl in the amygdala while it increases uh, activity in the forebrain and makes you feel m like more yourself. And they've actually done studies uh, using an authenticity index where they ask people on MDMA, you know, it's like, do you feel like you have to pretend, you have to fake, you know, and the, the one of the only drugs that we know of, if not the only drug where you take it and users report that they feel more themselves. Um, it's a good segue into the therapeutic med medical use of MDMA, which I'll get into, but I'll just kind of go through this really quick. MDMA binds to the reuptake transporters, causing them to pour a, a serotonin out into the synapse. That's how it works, um, according to a, our best scientific knowledge. Um, some researchers think it might enter the vesicle and cause the vesicle to dump all the serotonin, but the predominant theory that sort of withstood the test is that it actually sort of causes the reuptake transporters to work in reverse. Instead of sucking the serotonin back into storage, it pushes the serotonin out. And um, here's Prozac plugging the reuptake transporters um, so that the ecstasy, the little pink E, the MDMA can't get in. Um, my cute little drawing. Uh, let's see where we're at here. 
Yeah, medical use. Everyone here, I'm sure, knows about MDMA's use uh, in therapy. I mean, it, well, that's how it was used originally. Uh, I just talked about it. Who, know, who doesn't know about the current studies? There's four or five people. So uh, since 2009, MDMA has um, uh, been used in therapeutic studies treating post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, we can thank the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies who grew out of the therapeutic community that sued the DEA back in uh, 1985. They formed MAPS after they lost that case uh, in order to help bring MDMA through the FDA and make it into a legitimate medicine. And there have been studies since 2009 uh, they finished phase two, and the results have shown that 83% of the subjects uh, no longer met the criteria for PTSD at their two-month follow-up. Uh, these results are very, very high, much higher positive results than many drugs that actually succeed in phase three and get brought to market. So the MAPS believes there's really no stumbling block anymore to uh, MDMA's eventual approval as a treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder, and they even anticipate the date's gonna be 2021 at the conclusion of the phase three studies. Uh, even the, D even the, the Veterans Administration and the Department of Defense have gotten involved in the studies now because of the uh, compelling outcomes of the phase two studies. And uh, as everyone knows today, PTSD is an epidemic among veterans. There's also two other studies happening, but we have a question? Yeah, what yeah. kind of dosages were they, are, they using, are they using the less than 125 milligrams? Yeah, so phase, phase two is largely about determining what the proper dose in phase three is gonna be, and then you can't really use placebo with MDMA uh, because it's obvious, <laughs> but w one thing that MAPS found out is a lot of drugs, you, you can do a placebo-based kind of thing where it's different dosages. It's a double blind where the therapist and the patient doesn't know what dose they're getting. So they've tried three different doses. Uh, I think it's 70, 100, and 125. I know there is a low, middle, and a high uh, dose. And interestingly, they found the low dose um, to be, to have slightly greater outcomes. And that could be because there's less disorientation, less euphoria, less distraction on the lower doses where you're really about, uh, you're able to uh, talk and discuss with more, a little more clarity. Uh, but they also are allowing everyone in the study to take the high dose at least three times, um, which has been, according to the testimony of a lot of the subjects who I interviewed for my upcoming documentary, they were very happy to be able to get the high dose. So when the blind is broken, if it turns out that you got the low dose, you know, only you, you got the high dose only once and you got the, you're, you were allowed to, you then were able to, to get another, a fourth or a fifth session on the high dose. And so some of the veterans or other patients actually were able to get five sessions uh, on the MDMA. Uh, but there's actually two other studies happening right now um, using MDMA that were FDA approved and the DEA even approved, they have to approve the use of the drug and so even, they're coming along, they're not opposing these studies. Um, one of them is in Marin, using MDMA to treat uh, anxiety in terminally ill patients with cancer and their uh, family members. Um, and uh, another one, and it's just, just starting right now, another one also that's, that's in the middle is in San Diego, um, Alicia Dansforth and Charlie Grobe, who are using MDMA in uh, autistic adults based upon anecdotal evidence that MDMA helps autistic adults sort of reduce their social anxiety and understand the emotions of others, better able to communicate, and that the results are lasting, not just while they're on the drug, but even afterwards. So because of this uh, anecdotal evidence of recreational users on the autistic spectrum who are reporting this, they were able to devise a study and it's currently underway right now. Another question. Yeah. Yeah. One more just about the clinical study, study. Yeah. So they said it removed like most of the symptoms of PTSD. 
how long like after the dosages did they check back? Is like six months after? Or, like, well, the the a year or two. The the data that we have right now, uh, maps should be publishing data soon because the study just ended. But um, I don't, because some of the patients are just finishing up now, you, we won't have their follow-ups for a while. But the preliminary data was that at the two-month follow-up that most of the patients I went to at that point, 83% didn't meet the criteria for PTSD. And you got to understand how they come up with that criteria. These things called the CAP scores, and it's like, you know, 100 pages of questions you fill out, you know, 1 to 10 answer, how bad are your nightmares, you know, this and that, and, and your CAP score, you, 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 your severity of your post-traumatic stress is based upon how you answer these surveys, these long surveys. And um, uh, the 83 percent of the subjects didn't even meet the criteria for PTSD, uh, because their symptoms had been reduced so much at their two-month follow-up. They maps will probably be reporting on, you know, the six-month, year-long follow-up when the data arrives, but that's, uh, that's sort of how they do it. Um, I know the veterans I interviewed, one of them told me that their sleep problems and nightmares went away uh, immediately after their first session, and they never had uh, the kind of problem sleeping that they had had for years prior. Um, and uh, that, that, it, that it's not an instant cure though, right? They all said that it was about uh, processing and, and enable them to continue with a the therapeutic process that, uh, that and make advances. So, you know, PTSD is, is something that's never really cured. That's another thing I've learned. Um, you always live with it. You can't take the experiences back, whatever they happen to be. But another interesting thing, because um, I didn't know much about PTSD before I started making this film. And I just thought, oh, you know, you, you go to war, people are trying to kill you, you have this heightened fear response, and then you come back and you still have this heightened fear response. That, or, you know, you're raped and you're scared that you're going to get raped again. It was a very simplistic understanding of PTSD that I had. What I learned, which is very profound, I think, and I can't say it's for everyone with PTSD, but everyone that I interviewed, PTSD is very tied into your self-perception. Your sense of self and guilt and shame are a big, big part of it. So, you know, the classic one is I didn't do enough to save my fellow soldiers. Um, one of the Marines that I interviewed, he's going to be a main character in my film. Um, and his fellow Marine, who they served together, uh, accidentally killed two young girls in front of their father and haunted him. He said, I thought I was a monster. Carried the picture around with him of the blood in the truck. Um, said on the MDMA, he was able to forgive himself for the first time in six years. And even the rape survivor who that I, um, interviewed and uh, you know I asked her you know how, how, how could you blame yourself you know she was raped as a child um, and she said well for you know a decade or more I carried this around with me thinking there must be something wrong with me for these horrible things to have happened to me so trauma Just saying time's up. Right. what is it time's up. It's 849. 849 okay I was hoping you're gonna end soon, no <laughs> No, thanks. Thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, it's good. We got through most of the things and, and yeah, yeah, we're good. We're on time. But real quickly, so PTSD is very much tied in with your sense of self and to the degree that MDMA produces feelings of self-acceptance and allowing you to forgive not just other people but yourself, it r those are what the uh, interview subjects that I, I, that I interviewed testified to the fact. And that's um, um, very interesting to me because um, I didn't know that. <laughs>